This is part of our Greco-Roman series on ancient historical writers, or ancient writers in general. Uh, these are writers, again, from Greece and that of Rome, uh, in particular the Roman Empire, in particular Magna Graecia. Uh, we're talking about Herodotus and Thucydides today. Herodotus writing on the Persian Wars, and of course Thuc Thucydides writing on the Peloponnesian War. Um, both were historical writers, some of the first historians of all time. Uh, this is on Herodotus in regard to the Persians and the and that they had rejected uh, democracy. Uh, in the year 550 BCE, Cyrus the Great freed the Persians from their overlordship of their cousins, the Medes, and went on to create the largest empire yet seen in the Near East. It lasted for 200 years, two centuries, until it was conquered by Alexander the Great in 330 BCE. Cyrus ruled benevolently, it had been said, and humanely, reversing the harsh policies of the preceding Assyrian Empire and the Chaldean, or also known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire. To the Jews who had been exiled to Babylonia and were apparently now allowed to return to Judea and rebuild their sacred, destroyed temple, Cyrus was God's shepherd, they said, the anointed one to fulfill God's promise or purpose to them. To the Persians, he, however, he was first among equals and a father. On his modest tomb, which still stands in Pergamum, they placed this humble inscription, quote, O man, whosoever thou art and whence soever thou comest, for I know that thou wilt come, I am Cyrus, and I won for the Persians their empire. Do not therefore begrudge me this little earth which covers my body, end quote. Cyrus's son and successor, uh, uh, Cambyses from 530 to 522 BCE was neither modest nor humble proclaiming that the king can do as he pleases he elevated himself above the Persian nobility and re ruled despotically during his absence in Egypt which he had added to his empire the Persian priests the Magi took advantage of his unpopularity to foment a revolt he hurried home from Egypt but died on the way under mysterious circumstances so widespread was his unpopularity that the revolt spread rapidly. It took the Persian army, led by the nobility, three years to suppress it. The heads of great noble families then met to decide on what type of government to set up, a democracy, an oligarchy, or the aristocratic elite, or a monarchy. Of course, the, the default position for the Greeks was, of course, aristocracy. Um, the Greek historian Herodotus, who lived only three generations after these events and who traveled extensively in the Persian Empire, collecting material for his histor or history, inquiry, reports the essence of the ensuing debate which he strongly insists really did take place. It provides an explanation why the Persians, as well as all other peoples in the ancient Near East, never moved on to democracy, as the Greeks were the first to do. The Greek explanation for this failure, in Aristotle's words, was that these peoples, quote, were by nature slaves and so incapable of democracy. However, it would seem rather that they were content to be ruled by capable leaders such as others. And you can look at uh, Hammurabi and Amenhotep and Cyrus the Great, etc. With the exception of present-day Israel and Turkey, no stable democracy has emerged in the Near East since Hammurabi, a citizen of modern Iraq or ancient Mesopotamia recently said we have lived without choosing our own head of state so we have a different feeling about leadership in this part of the world we have an instinctive love for our leader if he is really a leader this view closely resembles that expressed by Darius who succeeded Cambyses as, as king of Persia and whose advo advocacy of monarchy is reported by Herodotus in the section when he says what government Darius asks, can possibly be better than that of one man, provided he is the best man for the job. We should not change the customs of our forefathers, which have worked well in the past. To do so would lead to disaster. And then we have Herodotus talking about the East versus the West. If history be defined as an honest attempt to first find out what happened, then to explain why it happened, as Herodotus has said, uh, he existed from around 484 uh, um, BCE to 425 BCE, uh, and he deserves to be called the father of history. Uh, his forerunners in this endeavor were the logographers, or writers of tales, or logoi, who arose during the late 6th 
6th century BCE, respectively, in Greek Asia Minor, where Herodotus was born, and in their lost works assembled a multitude of disarrayed facts on such diverse subjects as genealogy, local history, and geography. Herodotus was also a collector of facts and a teller of tales, but he went far beyond the logographers in the broad scope and unifying theme of his investigations, indeed, um, even having some inventions, uh, which we still use today as historians. Uh, the clash of two rival cultures uh, he wrote about, uh, which culminated in the Persian Wars, and in his concern for causation, of course, all this is clearly stated in his very first sentence, which could well serve as a title to his great work of narrative history. Quote, the researches or historia, historian Greek, of Herodotus of Halicarnassus, here set down that the deeds of men may not be forgotten, and that the great and noble actions of the Greeks and Asiatics may not lose their fame, and especially the causes of the war between them. End quote. The theme that gives unity to Herodotus's history is the age-old conflict between East and West, which began with the Trojan War and climaxed with Xerxes's colossal attempt to conquer Greece in the year 480 BCE, just a generation before Herodotus's time. Ten years earlier, however, the hoplites of Athens, which was Herodotus's adopted city, had humbled Xerxes's father Darius by pushing into the sea at the Battle of Marathon, the expeditionary force that the great king had set across the Aegean to punish the Athenian hoplites for aiding the abortive revolt of the Greek cities in Persia, Asia Minor. And of course, these were the uh, Marathonomachoi. Now, Xerxes had ready to combine land and sea operation, according to Herodotus, that it ultimately totaled 2,317,610 men and 1,207 warships. Of course, this is an exaggeration. And was uh, this uh, sea op operation was intent on ending for all time the troublesome meddling of the free Greeks in Persian affairs. By the time the Persians were ready to cross from Asia to Europe on two remarkable pontoon bridges thrown across the mile-wide Hellespont, 31 Greek states had put aside their petty quarrels and formed a confederation for the defense of their liberty against an alien despotism. And of course, uh, why would the Persians conquer the Greeks? All the Greeks were, were they had nothing to offer the Persians. Uh, they, they attacked the Greeks, the Persians attacked the Greeks because at, back then it was seen as a great thing to conquer other people. Um, in any case, uh, we have um, readings from Herodotus's history. Um, it begins with the preparatory activities of Xerxes and the Greeks and, and ends with the initial clash between the two armies at the narrow pass between the sea and mountain at Thermopylae, uh, where a hasty and simple Greek advance force of around 7,000 men met defeat. Although too little and too late sums up the Greek effort at Thermopylae, the courageous fight to the death of Leonidas and his small band of Spartans and Thespians had, has caused it to become celebrated as one of the most glorious defeats in all of history. It was followed by two great Greek victories that brought Xerxes' invasion to an inglorious end, a naval battle off of Salamis, in which the Greek fleet under Athenian leadership routed the Persian fleet and forced its return to Asia. And then there was a land battle the following year in 479 BCE at Plataea, where the superb skill and spirit of the Spartan hoplites commanded by Pausani uh, Pausanias, on whose subsequent career uh, we can discuss, discuss at a lot of time, dispersed and slaughtered the enemy until, in the words of Herodotus himself, of 300,000 troops, lest the 40,000 who fled, not 3,000 escaped, end quote. Many scholars have maintained that Herodotus' acceptance of greatly exaggerated estimates of the size of the Persian land forces discredits him as a historian. But others, however, noting that the history, in fact, was designed to be read aloud to festival audiences, have argued that he uses these figures because they had become part of the Greek tradition and because they were in keeping with the epic sweep and grandeur of his stated purpose, quote, that the great and noble actions of the Greeks and Asiatics may not lose their fame, end quote. Furthermore, such huge figures suited Herodotus' view of causation in history. They underlay his explanation of why a few tiny Greek states were able to defeat a mighty empire that stretched across 3,000 miles and commanded the resources of 46 nations to Herodotus, as to all Greeks, overweening pride or hubris inevitably leads to destruction or nemesis because God tolerates pride in none but himself. Thucydides, the failure of Sparta. 
Aristotle said once said that, quote, of the arts of peace, they knew nothing, end quote. The Spartan system was widely admired in Greece, particularly by aristocrats and after democracies began to falter by many intellectuals as well. Because Plutarch's idealized account reflects this admiration, it needs to be balanced by a more objective description of the actualities of the Spartan way of life. In Thucydides' brilliant account of the moral breakdown and miserable death of the Spartan royal regiment or regent and general uh, Pausanias, the renowned victor over the Persians in the last great land battle in 479 of the Persian Wars, we are given an insight into how Sparta's system of education and training, narrowly military and often brutalizing, failed to produce leaders capable of coping with problems in the larger world outside of Sparta. It is but one of several known instances from the 5th and 4th centuries that shows Spartans degenerating when removed from the rigid discipline of the barracks and the life of their homeland. Uh, we can look at uh, Thucydides, Thucydides, Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, uh, for example, and, and, and learn all about that. Uh, Thucydides uh, also uh, wrote the Statement's Handbook. He said, quote, My history has been composed to be an everlasting possession, not the showpiece of an hour, end quote, and uh, no doubt with reference to Herodotus. In the introduction to his history of the Great War from 431 to 404 BCE between the Athenian Empire and the Spartan League. Posterity has ever been in agreement with this appraisal. He knew that this war in which he was a participant represented a momentous crisis to which the political and economic development of the Greek world had led. His aim was to analyze this first Greek world war in order to acquire an exact knowledge of the facts that would be useful for future statesmen confronted by a like situation. In similar situations, Thucydides insisted like causes are always followed by like effects. He said, I shall be content if it is judged least useful by all who wish to study the plain truth of the events which have happened and which will, according to human nature, recur in much the same way. And he wrote that in his History of the Peloponnesian War. This emphasis soon upon quote, the plain truth of the events which have happened, end quote, is the foundation for Thucydides' reputation as a great historian, perhaps he may be even far more greater than Herodotus, the first critical writer of history, and his standard of scientific objectivity with regard to facts has ever been surpassed, never been surpassed. And so in this respect, he was a true son of his age, the last half of the 5th century BCE. During the previous century and a half, Greek thought had divorced itself from religion and myth-making, and by substituting reason and experience, had culminated in the critical thinking of the sophists, who uh, were Thucydides' teachers. And of course, the sophists were the ones that Plato wrote about in so his dialogue titled The Sophists, and of course, in many other uh, Plato's dialogues, uh, the sophists are the antagonists uh, whom Plato is arguing against. Uh, this new viewpoint, with its emphasis upon observed facts, also had produced in Thucydides' day the new science of medicine. It is not mere coincidence that the two contemporaries, Hippocrates in medicine and Thucydides in history, were the champions of the scientific approach in their respective fields. Hippocrates' famous aphorism, quote, every disease has a natural cause, and without natural causes, nothing ever happens, is echoed by Thucydides in his history. He said, quote, as for my narrative, it is not derived from any chance source, nor have I trusted to my own impressions only. It rests partly on my own experiences and things which I have seen with my own eyes, partly on the witnesses of others, which I have verified by the several and most minute tests possible. And this has been laborious, for eyewitness, eyewitnesses had not always the same tale to tell of identical events. Sometimes two memories served badly, or there was prejudice in one's, one direction or another. End quote. But what makes Thucydides' history so pertinent to us is the fact that the crisis in the Greek world that he described is basically similar to that, that confronting modern Europe, and even the whole world in general, in our own day. Now, as then, the underlying problem is the need for international trade by commercial and industrial states whose economies have outgrown their narrow national boundaries. Economic internationalism requires a corresponding political internationalism, in the Greek world, the only answer found for this problem between Athens and Sparta was the internationalism of the Athenian Empire, which formed a union of the eastern half of the Greek world 
and maintained the freedom of the seas in order to promote and ensure a flourishing interstate trade. We have seen in Pericles' fuel oration, for example, an idealized rationalization of the stern economic necessity for the Athenian Empire. But this view of Athens as an education to Greece was unacceptable to many other Greek states, which, led by Sparta, feared the expanding tyrant city, Athens, as a danger to their own independence. Indeed, Athens uh, pretty much um, had uh, made the other states pay tribute, and of course they were uh, paying tribute to uh, patron goddess of uh, uh, Athens, which was Athena. And in the words of Thucydides, quote, the real but unavowed cause I consider to have been the growth of the power of Athens and the alarm which it inspired in Sparta, this made war inevitable, end quote. In the modern world, the answer to this problem of international order versus national sovereignty is still being sought. Will the history of modern Europe and state hegemony, one may ask, be a repetition of that of the Greek states, which incapable of uniting, so weakened themselves by wars and depressions, that in the end they fell victim to an outside power, first Macedon and then Rome? Thucydides' masterly analysis of his own times was written to serve as a handbook for future generations, possessed of the wit to profit by the lessons of the Greek example. For this reason, the British, who see much of their own nation's experience and Athens' experience, have long called Thucydides' history the statesman's handbook. And we'll talk a little bit more about Thucydides. Um, in 428 BCE, one year after the death of Pericles, occurred an event that reveals the character of Athenian democracy when stripped of Periclean idealism and statesmanship. The island of Lesbos, encouraged by, by Sparta and led by the oligarchs of its chief city, Mytilene, withdrew from its alliance with Athens. Again, Lesbos is where we get the word lesbian. A lot of uh, women were infatuated with each other there. Um, but anyways, um, the revolt uh, was basically um, seen by the Athenians um, and uh, of course it was crushed and the Athenian assembly voted to make an example of Lesbos in, or, in order to discourage future rebellions within the empire. Um, a ship was sent with orders to the Athenian commander on Lesbos to put to death all men of Mytilene and sell the women and children into slavery. The next day reports to Cities, there was a feeling of repentance. They reflected that the decree was cruel and indiscriminate to slay a whole city and not the guilty only. The debate was reopened and the speech delivered on the occasion by Cleon, the promoter of the original policy of mindfulness, is given below in Thucydides' version. Of course, it is a typical example of Thucydides' use of speeches as a means of penetrating behind the facts to reveal and interpret the character and motives of both individuals and states. He admitted his inability to give verbatim reports of what was said, explaining that the speeches have been proposed as it seemed to me, each speaker would say what was most necessary about the various situations, keeping as close as possible to the general intent of what actually was said. Cleon represents the new type of democratic leader, the most violent of the citizens, Thucydides, giving, given to using unmeasured language to inflame the passions of the people. He prided himself on being a practical man. He was a leather manufacturer. He distrusted intellectuals of Pericles' type. Though cynically brutal, his convictions were honestly held, and he had enough of statesmanlike courage to oppose the views of his audience. His description of the fickleness of the Athenian populace was warranted. By a narrow margin, the assembly reversed itself and sent another order, which arrived in the nick of time to halt the whole-scale massacre of the Mytilenians. The questions posed by Thucydides, is democracy capable of running an empire, is a recurrent one. The Romans, as we shall see, faced it as well, and its modern version is the, a democracy capable of world leadership. Faces Americans today, for example. The Romans kept their empire and gave up democracy. The Athenians kept democracy and lost their empire. The Americans, while retaining democracy, may not have the will to retain world leadership. And then here we have the psychology of class war. Um, although the Peloponnesian War began as an attempt on the part of Sparta and its allies in Western Greece to destroy the Athenian Empire in 
put an end to the emerging economic and political unification of the Greek world under Athenian leadership. It soon became a struggle between the two rival ideologies of democracy and oligarchy throughout the Greek world. The genesis of the Spartan League lay in Spartan's fear that democratic ideas would undermine its totalitarian regime by inspiring revolt among the large mass of subject peoples over whom a small minority of Spartans ruled. To keep democracy and uh, equalitarian ideas as far as way as possible, the Spartans created an iron curtain by joining forces with the aristocrats in neighboring states and providing them with military aid to establish and maintain oligarchic regimes of their own. The resulting Spartan League was thus a confederation of oligarchic governments devoted to maintaining the status quo of the political subjugation of the common people. The Athenians used the same technique in reverse in extending and holding their empire as well. Being a democracy, Athens favored and maintained a power in the democratic element in its allied states, and these, in constant fear of their own aristocratic fellow citizens, welcomed Athenian friendship and leadership. The Peloponnesian War involved, therefore, a struggle between two opposed ideologies, and it was inevitable that both sides should seek to use the smoldering class hatreds existing in every state as a weapon in the conflict. The Spartan-inspired and oligarchic-led revolt of Mytilene from Athens has already been noted, but a more famous example concerned the island of Corsaira, or modern Corfu, Cor 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 located off the northwestern coast of Greece. The Athenians had earlier engineered an alliance with the democratic government of Corsaira, and as this state is well within the Spartan sphere of influence, the event was one of several incidents in Athenian expansion causing the fear that originally motivated Sparta to declare war. Finally, in the year 427 BCE, the Spartan League intrigued with the oligarchic party at Corsaira, and a bloody civil war resulted. Both Athens and Sparta sent aid to their respective factions, but the Democrats won the day and proceeded to liquidate all who were suspected of oligarchic sympathies. This and similar events inspired Thucydides to write the following analysis of the psychology of class war and its evil effects which undermined the moral principles of the Greeks. Then you have the Melian Dialogue. He said, Thucydides once said that the strong do what they can and the weak submit. In the year 416 BCE, the Athenians demanded the submission of Melos, the one island state in the South Aegean Sea that had remained both outside her empire and neutral up to this point in the war. When the Melians refused to surrender, they were overpowered after a six-month siege and all the men were slaughtered and the women and children enslaved. This incident would be historically unimportant, but for the dialogue which Thucydides presents as having occurred between the Melians and the Athenian envoys who brought the original demand for submission. Far removed from the idealism of Pericles, the Athenians were just here justify their empire solely on the grounds of power. Power, which accepts no limitation from either religion or justice, or even in contrast with the earlier Mytilenean revolt, pity. It is a classic example of Thucydides' use of speeches to comment upon the facts and draw universal principles from them. In his masterpiece of political commentary, he internalizes the conflict of the two irreconcilable principles of might and right. And then we have the Sicilian expedition. Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War has often been called a tragedy for it deals with the fall of a great empire. The historian's narrative is thus most powerful when describing the ill-fated Sicilian expedition of 1415 to 1413 BCE, where the tragedy reaches its climax. Again, the purpose of the expedition was to use economic pressure to bring Sparta and its allies to their knees by conquering the source of much of their food supply and markets on the populous island of Sicily. This accomplished, the Athenians believed that they would be strong enough, as Thucydides reports, to conquer the whole world. The blame for the failure of the project can be laid to the folly of the Athenian masses who appointed against his will a virtuous but timid and incompetent old general named Nicias to lead the expedition. This is the view of Thucydides, who saw the disaster as a product of the low quality of Athenian leadership since the glory days under Pericles, when what was nominally a democracy became in his hand government by the first citizen. 
with Pericles' successors, it was different, more on a level with one another and each grasping at supremacy. They ended by committing even the conduct of state affairs to the whims of the multitude. This, as might have been expected in a large imperial state, produced a host of blunders, among them the Sicilian expedition. And so we see within Thucydides' writings the mingled feelings of pride and apprehension among the citizens as they see the expedition off are contrasted with the pathos of the tragic fate of the beaten army and the arrival of the news of the disaster at Athens. Thucydides once said, quote, most glorious to the victors, most calamitous to the conquered, end quote. And then, of course, uh, this is concluding our introduction, introductory reading to Herodotus, as well as that of Thucydides, who were great writers of history after the time of the Periclean age.